Hey guys, uh, today we're going to talk about the Egyptian gods and goddesses. So we're uh, going to talk about these guys and we're not going to get into all of them because there's very many of them. Uh, but we're going to talk about the main ones today. The um, We're going to start with some vocab first and then we'll get into uh, the gods and goddesses and then we'll there's a little video at the end for, for you to watch. Um, so vocab, uh, so a couple words that are important to understand with uh, religion in, in this regard. Uh, first one is polytheism. Okay, so polytheism is the belief in many gods. Okay, so in ancient Egypt, they believed in multiple gods. Okay, so this leads to the second one, which is pantheon. So a pantheon is all of the gods of a people or a religion collectively. So when we're talking about these Egyptian gods, that's the Egyptian pantheon. In the next unit, when we talk about the Greek gods, that's the that's the Olympic pantheon, is what that's called. Okay, so those are the different gods that are within in that culture. Okay, uh, so the opposite of polytheism would be monotheism. So at this time, the only monotheistic religions that existed were Judaism, or was Judaism. Everybody else is polytheistic. Okay. All right, so the first god we're going to talk about is the god of the sun. His name is Ra, and he's first because he created everything, okay? He is believed to create all forms of life. Um, he is frequently merged with other gods such as Horus and Amun, and we'll talk about those um, when we talk about, we'll talk about his, uh, his merging with those guys when we talk about those two. But he also created the goddesses Bestet, Mat, and Hathor. Amun is the king of the gods, and he's the god of the wind. He's the patron god of Thebes. So Thebes is actually in what's called Lower Egypt. Nope, take that back. Thebes is in Upper Egypt. Lower Egypt is where, uh, like, the pyramids are up close to the delta of the Nile by the Mediterranean. Okay, so where Cairo is and that. Uh, Thebes is south of that, so it's in Upper Egypt. And it's kind of, there's like a bend in the Nile River, and Thebes is right on that bend. Um, anyway, uh, so Amun will eventually merge with Ra, and so he's often referred to as Amun-Ra, and he is the chief deity of the Egyptian empire. Okay, so because he's merged with Ra, he's, he's the head god. Okay. Uh, Nut, uh, she's the goddess of the sky. She's frequently represented as a star-covered woman arching over the earth or as a cow, okay? But we see her uh, here as this, and I'll show you as the, the arching woman uh, on the next slide. But she's believed to protect the dead who are entering the afterlife. So she's the mother of Osiris, Isis, Seth, and Nephthys, okay? So those four siblings. So she's the mother of them. This is her as the sky, basically. So Nut is um, is arching over the earth. Okay. Um, Osiris. So her oldest son is Osiris. He's the god of the afterlife, the underworld, and of resurrection. So his son is Horus, who we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but he's going to be killed by his brother Seth, and he will become. He became the wise and merciful god of the dead after he died, okay? He's also also associated with cycles in nature, like the annual flooding of the Nile River. So in the last set of notes, I talked about how um, the in the summertime, the snow melts on the mountains around Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria uh, floods, and then all that goes up the Nile, and uh, it floods in Egypt, and that's what gave them... Uh, give them some fertile land to grow crops on. So he is associated with that. So he's considered like one of the good guys, one of the good gods. Isis, she's a goddess of health, wisdom, and marriage. And she's the mother of Horus. She's the wife of Osiris, also the sister of Osiris. And she brought Osiris back to life after Seth had killed him. <clears throat> so she's worshipped as the ideal mother and wife. And she's frequently depicted with a uh, throne on her headdress. Okay, you can see that here, because uh, she's the queen. 
uh, Seth, or sometimes you'll see it as Set. Uh, but when I took mythology, when I was in school here, uh, the our teacher called him Seth. And so that's kind of what I've been calling him my whole life. But he's the god of storms, desert, chaos, and war. So he's kind of a, a meaner god. He's the husband of Nephthys, also the brother of Nephthys, and the father of Anubis. And we'll talk about him in a moment. He will... Uh, he will murder his brother Osiris. He's not murdered by his brother. He is murder. He murders his brother Osiris, and then he had many conflicts with Horus, uh, who is Osiris's son and Seth's nephew. But he's a trickster that causes disorder. That's kind of his thing. Uh, Nephthys is his wife slash sister, and she's the mother of Anubis. Um, she's a protective goddess, symbolizing the death experience. Uh, Horus, okay, so Horus is the god of the sky and of kingship, so he's the son of Osiris and Isis, he's the enemy of Seth, so him and Seth are in constant battle, okay, so whenever they're fighting, it means something bad is happening in the world, okay, um, so the living pharaohs are believed to be his incarnation, and he's often depicted with a falcon head which you can see right here. Anubis. So Anubis is the son of Seth and Nephthys, and he's associated with mummification in the afterlife. He's a protector and an embalmer, and it's his job to help souls reach the afterlife. And he weighs the hearts of the dead in order to determine whether they would be allowed in the realm of the dead. So what you have to do is when you die, you take your heart and you put it on the scale, and if it weighs too much, if you have too much sin on your heart, then uh, you don't get to go in. Uh, Thoth, or sometimes uh, Tot, or Tote, um, he's a god of knowledge, and he plays a major role in uh, the story we're going to see here in a minute. He is basically in charge of maintaining the universe, so kind of a big job and arbitrating godly disputes and judgment of the dead. And he's associated with magic, writing, and science. And, and he's also often depicted with the head of an ibis or sometimes a baboon. This is an ibis here. Okay, so this is the video. I want you to watch and make sure the volume's turned up so you can hear it. And then um, that's it. That's all I got for you today. Long before Ra, the sun god, had grown old and had left earth to dwell solely in the sky, he had ruled the earth and all of its inhabitants. He was able to see enough of the future to realize that any children by Nut, the goddess of the sky, would overthrow him as king. With his great power, Ra commanded that Nut should not be able to bear any child on any day of the year. This curse greatly distressed Nut. She knew that it could not be reversed. She consulted Thoth, a god of wisdom, education, and writing. If anyone could solve her curse, it was him. Thoth reasoned a way to get around Ra's command. In the act of superior cunning, he challenged Khonsu, the moon god, to a contest of checkers. For each game that Thoth would win, Khonsu had to give up a tiny portion of his life. Game after game, Thoth continued to win and Kansu ultimately lost a significant percentage of his life. Finally, Kansu would play no longer. Thoth gathered up all the light he had won, and from it fashioned five additional days that would belong to no year. Until then, a year had consisted of 360 days, the number of degrees in a circle. These new days would become festival days between one year and the next. Because of the losses, Kansu could no longer shine at a constant brightness throughout the month, but would have to grow dimmer toward the end of each month, and could only grow in brightness after the end of each month. Finally, Newt was able to have children. On the first festival day, she bore Osiris. Then, on each successive day, she gave birth to another god, Horus the Elder, Seth, Isis, and Nephthys. Ra's curse had been fulfilled to the letter, but it had also been defeated on a technicality. When Osiris came of age, he married his sister, Isis. Likewise, Set married Nephthys. 
Osiris, through the wisdom of his wife, became king of all Egypt, a land called in the early days Kemet, from Kum, which means black, like the dark, rich soil of the Nile flooding. Humans had not yet discovered agriculture, and frequently had turned to cannibalism in order to survive. They were a violent, warring lot, and this greatly distressed Isis. She discovered wild wheat and barley, which grew throughout the land. Osiris developed methods of cultivating these as crops, and taught humans the art of agriculture. He also taught them how to bake bread from the wheat, and how to brew beer from the barley. He taught them the arts of music and poetry. With every good thing that Osiris and his wife did for the people of the world, Set became more and more envious. The more people loved the God King and his wife, the more Set wanted to destroy them and to take the place of his brother on the throne. Osiris had gone on a long trip to other nations to spread the knowledge of civilization to other people. Isis ruled while he was away. When the king returned, Set was among the first to welcome his brother back. But the younger, jealous god had conspired with 72 of his wicked friends to defeat Osiris. Set had obtained the exact dimensions of his older brother and had commissioned the construction of an elaborate box to be made of cedar and ebony, plus gold and ivory. In celebration of his brother's return, Set threw the richest possible feast and invited his most loyal friends. After Osiris had grown relaxed and happy with song, food, and wine, Set brought out the elegant chest he had commissioned. He announced to the crowd that he would give this fine box to whoever would fit inside the chest perfectly. Several of the guests tried to fit within the finely made chest, but some were too short, too tall, too fat, or too thin. Finally, Osiris asked if he could try out the box. As the king hunkered down into the box, all of the guests gathered around in anticipation. Osiris cried out that the fit was snug. The chest is mine! Set hissed with glee. Yes, my brother, and it will be yours forever. With that, Set slammed the lid down, and as many guests as could reach the box helped to nail the lid shut. They sealed every crack with molten lead and tossed the chest into the Nile. The river carried the chest downstream, and it came to rest at the base of a tamarisk tree. Soon, the tree grew around the chest, hiding it from view. The mayor of the town saw that the tree had grown more beautiful than any other and claimed it for himself, not realizing that it contained the body of Osiris. Isis looked far and wide for her husband's body. Following all of the clues, she came to the town where the tamarisk tree grew. Isis, in disguise, went to work for the mayor's wife. While there, she grew fond of their children and offered to make one of them immortal. While she was passing the child through flame to burn away the mortal flesh, the mother attacked Isis, not understanding the great honor the goddess had intended to bestow on her child. Thus, the mayor's child lost its chance at immortality. Suddenly, Isis took off her disguise and revealed her true nature. The mayor and his wife fell down in terror, asking what they could do for the goddess to win her pleasure. Isis asked only for the tree and its contents. When she retrieved her husband's body, she let the mayor and his wife keep the tree, and it became the most prized possession in the town because it had held the physical body of a god. Isis attempted to use her own magic and that of Thoth to restore her husband's form long enough to conceive a son. Before she could finish, Set discovered the body of Osiris and cut it into 14 parts and scattered them up and down the Nile Valley. Again, Isis searched, this time for the various parts of her husband's body. After she had gathered them, she had Thoth help her make her husband whole long enough to acquire his seed. She immediately became pregnant with a son, whom she would come to name Horus. For years, Isis protected her son from discovery by Set and his evil friends. When Horus came of age, he set out to challenge his uncle for the throne of Egypt. The conflict between Horus and Set took many forms. In one instance, both agreed to take the appearance of Hippopotami and to fight each other underwater. Isis, fearing for her son, fashioned several harpoons and took flight to throw them at Set. When she threw the first one, Horus cried out, Mother, stop! You've hit your own son! After a few minutes of searching, 
She found seven and threw one harpoon after another. The first several either missed or bounced off. Finally, a harpoon struck Set squarely and wounded him. Set cried out for mercy, and Isis took pity on him. She helped him to the shore and nursed his wounds. When Horus heard what his mother had done, he grew so angry with her that he cut off her head and hid it from her in the desert mountains west of the Nile Valley. Realizing the mistake Horus had made, Ra, the sun god, came to the aid of Isis and helped to restore her head. In addition, he fashioned a crown of a cow's head and horns to give her added protection. Ra then punished Horus for what he had done to his mother. Despite the leniency shown him, Set still wanted to overcome his nephew. While Horus was recovering from the wounds Ra had given him, Set plucked out his eyes so that the young god was suddenly blind. Thoth found a formula from which he fashioned two replacements so that Horus could once see again. In yet another story, Ra commanded the Aeneid, Council of Gods, to ferry to the island of the middle ground and to judge between the two opposing sides, Horus and Set. Ra also commanded them to tell Nemti, the ferryman, not to take on as a passenger any woman with the likeness of Isis. So, Horus, Set, and the members of the Aeneid crossed over to the island and attempted to negotiate a peace. Isis, fearing that she and her son would lose to Set, turned herself into an old woman and tempted Nemti with a single gold ring as payment for passage to the island. Once on the island, Isis turned herself into a pretty maiden so that Set would be attracted to her. Set took a break from the meeting to be with the beautiful maiden, and Isis told him that her husband had died and that a stranger had claimed all of her husband's property. The same stranger had threatened to beat her son and to throw him out. She begged Set to become her son's protector. Overcome with sympathy, Set objected to the stranger's attempt to take their property, especially with the son of the former owner still there. Set said the stranger should be beaten with a rod, expelled, and the son be put in his father's position. At that moment, Isis turned herself into a bird and soared upward to alight in an acacia tree. She called out to Set, Be ashamed! Your own mouth has said it, and your own cleverness has judged you. What more can you say now? Set became humiliated and protested to Ra how Isis had deceived him. Ra told Set, See, you have judged yourself. What more do you want, then? Set condemned Nemti and demanded that the ferryman be punished because he had taken Isis to the island. So, Nemti was summoned before the Aeneid, and his toes were removed. And Nemti gave up gold from that day forward. In a final series of battles, Set was ultimately defeated, and the members of his forces were scattered across the world. If you're a fan of mythology, make sure to check out the link in the description so you can get a free ebook covering Egyptian, Greek, and Norse mythology. If you want to see more videos like this, hit the like button and subscribe. All right, so there's uh, the Egyptian stories. So um, I hope you guys all have a wonderful day. That's all I got for you today.